Okay, welcome Dr. Mike o Osterholm and thanks for meeting with me even though you're extremely busy for this Center for Ethics um, series that we're doing. You are a Luther alum and you've been in many places. You've been busy these past two months. So why don't you start by telling us what your position is, what your work is and how it is that you're speaking for the medical community so frequently. Well, thank you very much, Joy, for the opportunity to be with you. Uh, yes, I am a Luther alum, very proud of that fact. Uh, I graduated from Luther in 1975, and from there went immediately to the University of Minnesota in graduate school to become a medical detective, something that I've spent the next 45 years of my career doing. Um, I uh, started out at the university uh, there and then joined the Minnesota Department of Health shortly after arrival. Uh, as a student and a worker at the health department, and then just stayed uh, for 25 years there. Many of them spent a state epidemiologist where we built a team of infectious disease experts in terms of, of medical detective work. Then uh, uh, in 2000, I went back to the university full time. I had always been there uh, and uh, formed the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. And uh, that center was really based on trying to merge policy and science together in a way that could uh, result in meaningful impact uh, on what we do and how we do it with regard to infectious diseases with the public. Uh, pandemic preparedness has always been a real interest of mine. I wrote articles about it back in the 1990s. Uh, in 2005, I wrote pieces in the New England Journal of Medicine and Foreign Affairs about our lack of preparedness and I wish I could only go back to 2005 because, and frankly, we were more prepared back then than we are today. Um, in 2017, I wrote a book called Deadliest Enemies, Our War Against Killer Germs, in which actually I laid out uh, the threat of pandemic illnesses uh, and specifically looked at influenza as a model. Uh, and I laid out a scenario of an influenza pandemic beginning in China, moving around the world. And if you just take off the word influenza and put coronavirus into it, it pretty much followed the exact scenario I laid out of the book. Uh, the unfortunate part is we still have a ways to go. So this is an area that uh, is of real interest to me. Um, and uh, it's one that uh, we all, I think, recognize now the impact it's having on society is quite remarkable. Yeah, let me start by asking you about your book. Um, so you, in a way, you predicted this pandemic, which you have one of the professions where it's not great when you're, <laughs> when you're exactly right. Are there any aspects of it that have surprised you that have not worked out the way that you thought they would work out or have been worse or better than you anticipate? No, I can't say there's anything that's really surprised me. Um, uh, I think there are issues now about where are we going to go. Uh, in the early part of uh, December, this virus emerged in Wuhan, China, started causing transmission there. We picked it up like much of the rest of the world, the end of December as a potential challenge uh, to, to infectious diseases, uh, not only in China, but potential for the world. And have been following it very closely ever since. Uh, we, we determined in our group, and uh, I put out a piece on January 20th saying that there was no doubt that this was gonna cause a worldwide pandemic, a coronavirus, not an influenza virus. And uh, uh, in fact, as you know, obviously it did. But then in addition, the first week of February, I put out additional documents explaining how it would unfold around the world in that the incubation period is about five days from the time one's exposed till they get infected and are transmitting the virus. And that the, what we call the r naught or the average number of people who likely would acquire an infection from an infected person was at least two. Um, that you could look at, well, what might happen in terms of if this virus moved to a different location, such as the United States, Europe, other parts of Asia. And so if you think about one incubation period, one patient infects two people, the next one, two infects four, four infects eight, 16, then it would take at least five to six weeks before enough transmission would occur that areas of the world would begin to see that. Well, sure enough, as you know, the last week of February, the first week of March, we saw this show up around the world, Iran, uh, Italy, the United States, um, other countries in the EU, et cetera. And so it really it followed very much a pattern that we uh, suspected it would follow. 
I think where we're at a point now, though, is saying we don't know where it's going to go next. And what I mean by that is, is that there are certain, you might call them virus gravity principles that are still operating. Uh, a virus like this, this spread by the respiratory route, is going to continue to get transmitted until a sufficient number of people get infected and hopefully develop uh, at least short-term immunity so that they, they are not able to be infected again. And they almost become like rods in a virus transmission reactor. Mm -hmm. So that basically at that point, uh, there isn't any additional transmission. Well, if the virus is infectious, we're going to need at least 60 to 70% of the population to be immune through either having acquired it as a result of their, their illness or a vaccine, which isn't forthcoming yet. Why that's important is because right now our best guesstimate is, is that we're no higher in terms of number of people who are, uh, in, have been infected than between 5 to 15 percent. 15 percent in the hottest spots like New York City, 5 percent for much of the rest of the country. That's a long ways from 60 to 70 percent. Mm -hmm. So when you think about how much damage this virus has already caused, think how much we have left to go. And so that part is the surprise part is you might say, well, how's that going to look? We have a document coming out very shortly from our center that lays out in a sense the scenarios. One being that like pandemic influenza, there'll be a big peak uh, five to six months after the initial arrival of the virus, which would then place it sometime in the summer, early fall. There's those that might be just the kind of peak and valleys, not big ones, but lots of them and just keep happening and happening in different locations. And then there's one that we kind of called the slow burn, which is where it just stays like it is kind of right now. Uh, we don't see major, major hotspots, but we do see localized hotspots such as meat processing plants. And then it just continues to burn on and on until it gets closer to that 60 to 70% level. We don't know which of those scenarios or maybe a fourth scenario that will ultimately uh, be what happens. But that's the point we're at right now. If there's a surprise, it'll be which one it is and how and why did it happen. So does that, given that we, there are several scenarios that might happen and we don't know which will be the one, how does that affect our planning going forward? How do we forge next steps in all of that uncertainty? And that is obviously the trillion dollar question right now uh, and potentially the million person lives. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have to prepare for the worst case scenario, uh, the big peak, which could occur, you know, they like said this summer or this fall. Um, with that kind of situation, you have to assume a maximum stress on your healthcare uh, mm -hmm. system. You have to uh, realize that life as we know it will be shut down even much more than it has been to date. Uh, and that it could last for five to six weeks. Um, that, that's scary. Uh, for a lot of people, but it's much better to be scared and know than to scared and not know. And also, as I've said many times, my job is not to scare people out of their wits, but into their wits. Mm -hmm. And I think that what's happening right now is there's this almost sense of, oh, we're over the hump, we're done. If we just get through and get open back up, everything will be fine. And I keep telling people we're only in the second inning of a nine inning game, and uh, we've got a lot left to play. So. I heard you in another interview this week talking about a, a creating a sustainable sort of post-lockdown life, but it sounds as though from what you're saying here that it's not post-lockdown, it's a sustainable living with COVID-19 life. Is that a more accurate description where we go into yeah. and out of lockdown? Well, I think first of all, we all have recognized that um, far too often we've had to learn how to die with COVID virus. Mm -hmm. And that surely is a challenge that's going to continue. We're not going to get necessarily that much better at it. We're going to experience it more. But I think what we do have to get much better at is learning how to live with the virus. How do we actually exist every day in our society? You know, I, I worry that people sometimes feel like this discussion is about dollars versus lives. And it's not. It's not just about an economy. It's about society. It's our way of life. It's about do we have college classes uh, in the building on campus, or do we have them by remote? Uh, how do we run uh, everyday life? And that's the challenge I think we're all facing right now is uh, what that means. And until you know what this virus is going to do, it's hard. So I say plan for both staying away, uh, 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 you know, in everyday life as you would if this virus weren't happening, and plan for if it's the worst disaster. 
and then be able to adjust between the two. Um, so I think people ask me all the time, for example, should we cancel fall classes? I said, no, 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 it's way too early. We don't know what's going to happen yet. So plan like that's going to happen, but also plan as if we could have a huge wave that literally shuts down the world for six weeks or more. And we have to plan for that one too. Nimbleness and flexibility are going to be our key words, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So what you said at the beginning that we were more prepared in 2005 than we are now. What, what are the lessons that we take from this and hopefully carry forward so we're more prepared in the future? Well, you know, I look at the world as we know it today, and it's all about uh, the shortest supply chain one can find in terms of uh, goods and services to consumer. Um, that obviously is what you go to business school to get your MBA for. You don't go to build in more capacity by storage or warehousing things. And uh, what happened over the course of the last 10 years is that we've outsourced many of our production lines to countries like China, where it's just in time delivery and the product coming to places here. In 2005, our ability to respond to a pandemic actually was much more robust because we had more capacity for medical supplies, drugs, uh, personal protective equipment right here in the United States. Uh, it wasn't outsourced. It wasn't shipped off to some other place in the world. Uh, and so today we have a much bigger challenge in terms of, of getting the drugs that we need. Uh, we're doing a lot of work right now at our center on drug shortages, and they're gonna grow only more acute because so many of these drugs are made in China and India. And uh, even though they're life-saving critical drugs that we need, we don't have really any control over them except as an end consumer. And so uh, this is why in 2005, we actually had more elasticity, more surge capacity in our system. Today, we have very, very little. So one last question that brings us back to Luther, and that is we're about to roll out a new interdisciplinary major next fall in global health, which has been in the works for years, and we did not anticipate a global pandemic as the backdrop for it. But what would you say to students who are thinking of going into that major? Well, obviously, as a very big supporter of that major and having <laughs> discussed that with Luther faculty for some time, I have to admit my bias right up front. I think it's absolutely critical. Uh, you know, I worry a little bit that people say, okay, the last big one was 1918, this is 2020. If I prepare for the next 100 years, I'll be fine, okay? Uh, I think that's not the message we must send at all. Uh, I worry that uh, these are gonna happen with more frequency, uh, as we now have 8 billion people on the face of the earth, one of every eight people who's ever lived is here. Uh, how we eat the food we eat and how we grow it, whether it be poultry, whatever, has changed dramatically over the course of the past several decades. So we're more ripe for viruses jumping from animals to humans, causing these kind of pandemic events than we've ever been. So anyone who uh, chooses a career in global health, I guarantee you it'll not be boring, it'll be meaningful, and Luther's the right place to actually get that education. Uh, I just regret that we may end up having an altered fall semester. But then again, that's a learning experience too. Uh, adversity will come at you all the rest of your life. Um, learn through adversity how to live the way that you want to live, the way that you should live. And don't let adversity control you. You control adversity. And that's, I think, a, a message that we hear often at Luther. Now you are a poster child for the product of a liberal arts education and we're grateful for your work and for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I, I'm a very, very fortunate man to have gone to Luther. I say this with all sincerity. Uh, Luther College is the reason why I'm where I'm at today. It, uh, it was the perfect uh, blend of academia, of personal relationships, of challenges, uh, uh, both uh, intellectually and emotionally. And it was also a source of great support. And uh, my continued relationship with Luther is in some ways my, my rock, it's my foundation. So I, uh, I can't emphasize enough to those who go to Luther now that uh, you'll have great benefit, but nothing to what you may very well experience for the rest of your life. So go for it.